Faith Dimensions invites you to understand more fully the subject of righteousness by faith. This is a series of 20 Christ-centered messages from the dynamic new book and study guide entitled 95 Theses by Morris Vinden. Now, with today's message on relationship, here is Pastor Morris Vinden. I have a heavy-duty question for you. Which is more important, getting married or staying married? That sounds like a simple question, but I have seen people tear their minds all out of shape trying to figure out which of those is more important. And if they say uh, getting married is more important, then I say to them, well, what do you have against staying married? And if they say staying married is more important, and then I ask them, what do you have against getting married? And finally, we decide that it's a stupid question in the first place. The truth is that they are both important, and it is fruitless to try and figure out which one is the most important. Let's change it to another setting. Which is more important, becoming a Christian or staying a Christian? Or are they both important? I'd like to remind you that according to the Bible, he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew 24. So it is just as important to stay with Christ as it is to come to him in the first place. Now, in living the Christian life, then, one of the most important subjects we can study is the personal daily relationship with God. Jesus talked about it, and uh, the Apostle Paul talked about it. The Old Testament prophet talked about it, Jeremiah. He's the one who said, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the strong man glory in his strength. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord. God talking through the prophet of old. Jesus said it in John 17, verse 3, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So eternal life is based on knowing God. Well, uh, would we say then that uh, salvation comes by knowing God? Not really. The truth is that knowing God and keeping in touch with Him day by day through communication is the way by which we continue to stay with Him or continue to accept of His grace day by day. And if we don't accept of his grace day by day, according to Jesus, we're going to die. It's just that simple. We're going to die. Let's notice it in a uh, teaching that Jesus gave, found in John, the sixth chapter. <clears throat> Here it says something that uh, was rather astounding or surprising to the Jewish people at that time. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So in this discourse, he's talking about the bread of life. This is the bread of life sermon, if you please. It happened after the religious leaders had come to him and said, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Clearly a behavior type question. But Jesus came back with a relationship type answer. He said, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. And then follows these verses concerning the bread of life. The uh, people at that time murmured at him, it says, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. He was using a, an illustration going back to the Old Testament of the manna that fed the people of Israel in the wilderness. Again, he says in this uh, sixth chapter of John, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. 
This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. That sounds good, doesn't it? Are you interested? Then uh, Jesus said unto them once more, Except ye eat the flesh and uh, drink the blood of the Son of Man, ye have no life in you. So he goes so far as to say that the bread of life must be eaten, and he likened it to his flesh and blood. This, of course, wouldn't go with the cannibals in the South Seas. They would be all too glad to uh, heed the counsel of this passage of Scripture. But the people at that time knew what he was talking about. They had some Old Testament background to uh, help them understand. Once more, Jesus said, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. Or shall we say, dwelleth in relationship with me and I in relationship with him. Well, as he got toward the close of this discourse, the uh, people said, uh, we're confused. We don't understand. We're even offended. And Jesus knew what they were saying among themselves. He knew what they were thinking. And so he said, does this offend you? Then he gave them a clue. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So he gives us the interpretation of what he's talking about. He said he's talking about the word of God, the way by which we come into relationship with him and through getting into the Word of God, which reveals Jesus, which reveals the God who loves us, we are able to understand what it means to eat the bread of life. There is a, a chapter in the last book of the Bible, Revelation 3, which talks about Jesus standing at our heart's door and knocking. Behold, he said, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Jesus wants to come into our hearts and he wants to eat with us. This is one of the most intimate things we do. We don't usually sit around the table and eat with our enemies. We eat with our best friends. And so Jesus wants to come for dinner. But what do we have to serve him? He wants to come for breakfast. What do we have to serve him? I heard an experience several years ago that has always intrigued me about these vacationers in uh, California who were drove up into the Redwoods in Northern California. And they got there kind of late to the camp place where they were going to stay. And uh, so they hurried and managed to get into the store just before it closed and uh, buy a couple of things like some beans and some milk. They moved into the campsite and pitched their tent and got ready for their weekend stay. They decided to go to church the next day and they went to the church. People in the lobby were friendly, especially one particular lady. Maybe she was the one paid to welcome everybody, but she seemed to really love it and enjoy people. So she welcomed them to the church. And after the service was over on the way out, she welcomed them again and then said, where are you staying? And they told her they were staying out in a certain campsite out there in the Redwoods. And she said, good, we're coming for dinner. Well, the people said, I beg your pardon? She said, no, we're coming for dinner. They rushed to their car and they spun gravel all over the place and hurried out to the campsite and they got the beans out of the chest and they opened the milk and they put water in the milk and water in the beans and tried to get everything so that they could have guests for dinner. And then of all things, into the campground came three carloads full of people from the church. Three carloads. Well, they broke out in a cold sweat. They didn't know what to do until the people got out of their cars and they began to unload the uh, entrees and the salads and the uh, cake and the punch, everything imaginable. They had brought the dinner with them. And our friends at the campsite hurriedly pushed the beans and the milk back into the back of the tent and prepared for a real feast. 
As I heard the story, I thought about Jesus, who stands at our heart's door, and he wants to eat with us. He says, I'm coming for dinner. Well, what can we serve him? Nothing. He brings it all. He brings it all with him, because Jesus is the bread of life. Now, when Jesus used this illustration in John 6 about physical food and eating, he was referring to this Old Testament passage in Exodus, the 16th chapter. Exodus 16 talks about the experience when uh, the people of Israel woke up one morning and noticed something on the ground. It was God's blessing of food to eat that came down from heaven. It says, and when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is manna. Or the manna word means really, what is it? So what they said actually was, it is, what is it? For they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, this is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating. So let's take a few clues from this scripture and try to understand better what a personal daily relationship with God is like. How can you have a meaningful devotional life? The first thing we notice is gather of it everyone according to his eating. And they gathered some more and some less. I can remember talking to some godly saints who spent hours in their Bible. And as a young preacher, I didn't spend hours in my Bible. I didn't spend hours in prayer, and apparently they did. And I wondered how they could do that. And then it dawned on me that uh, God approaches each one of us according to our own diet. Some people might not be able to eat very much to begin with. Others might eat long of the bread of life, but everyone according to his eating. If we follow through on the illustration of food, physical food, then we know this much, that at least your devotional life is going to include something more than a text for the day with your hand on the doorknob. How fat would you be or how long would you live if that's all you did when it came to physical food? A breadstick for the day with your hand on the doorknob. Some people can do that for a day or two, but not for long. So, uh, in the analogy, we have all of the suggestions and ingredients of a meaningful devotional life. First of all, gather everyone according to his eating. And uh, says in verse 19, Moses told them, let no man leave of it till the morning. That's the next clue for a meaningful devotional life. Yesterday's manna is no good for today. In fact, if they tried to keep it over, it uh, did not keep. It uh, actually spoiled. If we try to live today on yesterday's devotional life, it won't work. Eating is a daily matter. Jesus said it in Luke, the ninth chapter. If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself Take up his cross daily and follow me. Daily matter. So, don't rely this year upon last year's experience or even today on yesterday's devotions. Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto Moses, but some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was wroth with them. That's the result of trying to live on a second, third, fourth day, fourth year experience. There are some people who became Christians 20 years ago, and they've done nothing about it since. There are some people who were married 20 years ago, and they've done nothing about that since either. There are some things that do not last unless they are kept up and are fresh every day. And then it goes on to say they gathered it every morning, everyone according to his eating, and when the sun waxed hot, it melted. So here is the next clue. 
Take your time alone with the bread of life in the morning. If uh, the personal experience with God is a daily matter, then of course the most important time to experience it is when your day begins in the morning. Now let's put this together and come up with a simple prescription for a meaningful personal relationship with God. Time alone at the beginning of every day to seek Jesus through his word and through prayer. Time. How much time? Well, the illustration is clear. To spend as much time alone with God day by day as we do eating our meals. Maybe that's why a godly writer of yesteryear said it in these words. It would be well to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. That's about the time we spend eating. If we take all three meals, it's a good suggestion. It makes sense. It isn't talking about spending all day long becoming a hermit or a recluse. It's not talking about spending all night in prayer like some people think they have to do and then advertise it to everybody else. It is a sensible approach to a spiritual life on the part of real people. As much time with God alone as we do eating our meals. Time alone. That's another key word. Eating is a very personal matter. Nobody can eat for another. It's impossible. We must eat for ourselves. Public worship, public prayer has its place, but this is not it. Family devotions and family prayers are important, but they will not suffice for this. When we talk about a personal relationship with God, we're talking about just that, personal. Time alone. At the beginning of the day, the beginning. Well, some people say, that's the worst time of my day. When I get up, don't anyone speak to me till noon. And there are some people who find that that's the lowest time of their metabolism. Maybe so. Maybe we shouldn't be too hard and fast on this rule. But the important thing is consistent time with God, not on again, off again. And most people I talk with tell me that if they do not start their day with God, it's very easy to forget it altogether and come up to the close of the day with nothing to pray about except forgive me all my sins and baubles of today. If you'd like to know a difference in your personal spiritual life, then change your time with God from a few sentences at night before you fall into bed or fall asleep praying to a meaningful time in the morning. And there will lie a great secret for you, perhaps. Time alone at the beginning of every day, not just once a week, not just Christmas and Easter. We don't treat our bodies that way. We find it important to feed our bodies, pay attention to physical things. Other things don't crowd those out. Why should they crowd out the things of God? every day to seek Jesus or to seek God who Jesus was through his word and through prayer. That means that if we're going to be looking in the Bible for that which is most helpful in the personal relationship with Christ, we are going to be reading for our devotional life the things that have the most to do with Jesus. And here is a good clue. A thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. Uh, the genealogies in the Old Testament, the chronologies of the Old Testament, the historical and prophetic books are all significant and have their place. But if you want to have a meaningful time with God day by day, you're going to focus on the things of Jesus and go to places like the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You're going to read books on the life of Christ and what Jesus said and what he taught. That's the way you seek to, fe to, to have fellowship and communion with him. And then the method by which it happens 
is always important to be reminded of. We seek Him through His Word and through prayer. That's the way we come to Him in the first place. And that's the way we stay with Him. All of the intangible, nebulous phrases that Christians use become meaningful when we get to the Word of God and to prayer as the two tangibles that make them all real. So uh, we don't come to Christ by thinking some happy thoughts from our own imagination. We don't come to Christ by simply jumping out of bed in the morning and looking up toward heaven and saying, I believe. We don't come to Christ by uh, accepting righteousness by faith as nothing more than an opinion. We come to Christ experientially by getting into his word and in prayer. That is the secret of the personal relationship with him. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, many people call this the devotional life, the devotional life. Some people call it the quiet time. Whatever you call it, the devotional life is not all bad. It's a rather good label for this experience for this reason. Everybody in the world has a devotional life. Did you know that? Oh, no, you say, I thought it was just the Christians. No, everybody in the world has a devotional life. Some people's devotional life is to get the uh, Sunday morning paper, sit down and uh, open up to the sports section and spend all morning pouring over the sports section, memorizing the scores and the players and what they did and what they didn't do. That's their devotional life. That's what they're devoted to. That's where the word devotional life comes from. Some people, of all things, will take the smallest print in the newspaper and pour over it for hours. That small print that you can hardly read. Why? You know why. Because they have some kind of investment in the stock market. And they're devoted to that section of the paper. Some people spend all day watching the uh, television and the sports. That's their devotional life. That's what means the most to them. Some people spend their time involved in uh, rock music. That's their devotional life. Other people spend hours on the soaps. That's what they're devoted to. Some people spend long times in front of the mirror making up their face. That's their devotional life. You go right down through it, and whatever catches your attention, whatever you are most preoccupied with, that's what you're devoted to. And whatever you're devoted to, you will become more like. If it's a star, an actor or an actress, or some other hero, you become like your heroes. And I have this question to put to you, which is very simple, and very real. Why should we spend time on that which is not bread and waste our money on that which does not lend to life eternal. We put forth such effort toward mundane things. I remember a student in college. He was uh, having a hard time in college. And he'd try to study. And uh, in order to stay awake to study, he'd have to stand up. And he did. I can still see him standing up in the parlor of the men's dorm one night, trying to study. He stood up so he wouldn't go to sleep. But he still got sleepy, so he got a pan of ice cubes and a washcloth, and he put this on top of the piano where he was standing. And every little bit, he'd put an ice cube in the washcloth, dip it in the ice water, and put it on each eye. Then he'd keep studying again. Going through desperate struggles to understand something about the academia necessary to get him through to a liberal arts degree. For what purpose? for three score years and ten. Well, if we will go to those kind of efforts for the sake of the history professor or the sociology books or courses or whatever it might be, why shouldn't we put forth those kind of efforts toward knowing God 
toward becoming acquainted with Jesus Christ, whom to know is life eternal. It's the only sensible thing to do. And all the time, this one who loves us and who went to the cross to take our place says in the book, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, we pray that you will save us from becoming so preoccupied with time that we forget about eternity. We pray that you will help us to understand what it means to stay with you as well as come to you. We pray that you will lead us as we try to respond to your knock day by day. Make the Bible more meaningful to us. Help us to pray with understanding and teach us to know you better as we seek you more and to trust you for this life and for the future. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's the good news for the planet Earth where there are four things that God does not know. God does not know a sin he does not hate. God does not know a sinner he does not love. God does not know a sin he won't forgive. And God does not know a better time than now.